An old adage tells us that everyone loves a good mystery, part of the reason this channel is still in existence. But if we're to take this assertion at face value, then we must also acknowledge that another truism is not far behind. Everyone loves a good ghost story. And more often than not, that's just what they are, stories. Most of the time, these entertaining tales have been created purely from whole cloth and have little to no basis in reality. Perhaps this explains why we remain so skeptical. But what of the legends and tales which are not quite so shrouded in ambiguity? What of the tales where the names, dates, and places are not only known, but have actually been written into the historic record? Four years ago, we profiled the case of Zona Hester Shue, a resident of Greenbrier County who allegedly returned from the grave to name her own murderer in court. Whether truth or hallucination, her words were read into the official court transcript and thus became a somewhat offbeat record of events. As it turns out, Hester Shue is not the only spirit to have faced a none-too-pleasant ordeal with the courts. Our first story takes us all the way back to the year 1850 in the Ohio River community of New Martinsville. It's a story which may at one time have found itself on this channel's regular thread. For long before it became a ghost story, it began its life as a missing persons case which later evolved into an unsolved case of murder. Unsolved despite the fact that the victim apparently went well beyond all human efforts to name his killer. Several of our stories over the last five years have prominently featured the great Ohio River as either a backdrop or a de facto participant. The reason is very simple. For the first 50 to 75 years after independence, the river became the main, and in some cases, the only means of access into what was then Western Virginia. This resulted in a somewhat unusual and seemingly backward path of settlement. While the distance was greater, it was far easier to reach, say, the Kentucky Territory by river as opposed to the routes flown by birds. Traveling due west from Richmond to Point Pleasant or Cincinnati was more than just a tall order. It was a genuine risk to life and limb. As a result of the Ohio's circular conduit, Settlers first came west all the way to what is today the West Virginia-Ohio border, and then gradually moved eastwards into the Kanawha Valley and other central points. Today, it is far easier to find an antebellum hamlet along the Ohio River as opposed to the state's geographical center. One such hamlet is the small river city of New Martinsville, the county seat of Wetzel County. Incorporated in 1838 simply as Martinsville, the town would really not hit its economic stride until the 1880s when the oil and natural gas boom swept the region. Despite this, its strategic location along the Great Ohio meant that it would always serve some purpose. Around 1850, a man named John Gamble came to the New Martinsville area from his home in Beaver County, Pennsylvania. Gamble was 36 years old and a carpenter by trade. He apparently had a head for business. 
Gamble set himself up along the West Virginia side of the Ohio River near what was then known as Sardis Station. As a river merchant of sorts, he made his living selling and trading goods to the families living in the rural area and as far away as Cincinnati. As the legend goes, the year 1850 saw a bumper crop of apples. Land purchased by John Gamble featured two large orchards. Gamble hired a number of local residents and proceeded to turn his crop into several large barrels of apple cider. Gamble, however, eventually found himself with more apples than barrels. Not wanting to miss the golden opportunity, Gamble took his skiff and floated downriver to New Martinsville on November 12, 1850. He is reported to have purchased his barrels and started back for home without incident. Contemporary accounts state that sometime earlier, John Gamble had sold a wagon to a group of brothers named Whiteman. The Whitemans paid John Gamble with a $20 note. He also had purchased a young calf from a man named Laban or Leb Mercer. Gamble still owed Mercer two dollars in payment. On his way home from New Martinsville, Gamble stopped at the home of the Whiteman brothers to see if they wanted to cash the note. Fortuitously, or perhaps ominously, Leb Mercer just happened to be at the Whiteman's home that same evening. Mercer asked Gamble for the outstanding debt, in response to which Gamble is said to have produced a five-dollar bill. He said he had nothing smaller, and Mercer apparently had no change. What Gamble did have on his person was an additional $200 in larger bills, a fact which he perhaps inadvertently related to Mercer and the Whiteman brothers. Darkness was fast approaching. Gamble told Leb Mercer to stop by his home in a few days, and he would make good on the $2 debt. Gamble left the Whiteman's home, boarded his skiff, and sailed off, apparently into eternity, for he was never seen again, or at least not in the flesh. What happened next has never been resolved with any degree of certainty. Some say Laban Mercer walked with Gamble to his boat. Others say he simply watched as Gamble left and continued downriver. Either way, the two parted company. Later that evening, a couple of men lying along the river bank caught sight of Gamble's skiff and managed to pull it ashore. The barrels purchased by John Gamble were there, but John Gamble was not. Rumors later circulated that Leb Mercer had returned home at about 2 a.m. that night, covered in mud, and in possession of the $20 note John Gamble had previously brandished. Months later, a body, eventually identified as that of John Gamble, was found along the shore near Ryan's Run. Curiously, Gamble carried no papers or other personal effects, and the pocket in his pantaloons had been cut off. The state of decomposition was reportedly so advanced that a positive identification was not made until Gamble's widow identified a pair of socks that she had personally knitted for him. Suspicion naturally fell upon Leb Mercer, but with no real evidence to speak of, the matter was left unsettled. The legal case, however, was not the only thing to have been left unsettled. Three years passed. In late October of 1853, several residents of New Martinsville left to attend a corn husking on Point Pleasant Ridge, about five miles away. Late that night, after darkness had descended, three men, including John Hindman, the proprietor of the Wetzel House, were walking home. At some point, Hindman suffered an asthma attack and was forced to slow down. Heinemann soon found himself alone. The night was clear and the moon full. Heinemann decided to take a shortcut across farmland owned by Robert W. Cox. 
It was in the middle of one of Cox's fields along the river bottom that Hindman is said to have received the surprise of his life. All at once, the semi-transparent figure of a man appeared about three feet in front of him. Hindman froze in his tracks. Before he even had time to gather his wits, the apparition, ghost, person, or whatever it was, spoke to him. According to official documents, John Hindman heard the following words. You don't know me. I am John Gamble, the man that was murdered by Laban Mercer. Your courts have not done me justice. I want you to have him arrested, and they will do me justice. With these unambiguous words, the specter faded away. John Hindman had never met John Gamble, and had always fancied himself a hardened skeptic when it came to ghosts, spirits, and the like. However, something about the earnestness and sincerity of the phantom's words prompted him to pursue the matter further. Hindman sought out Laban Mercer and questioned him about John Gamble and the night he vanished. History doesn't record the exact words but something Mercer said further prompted John Hindman to immediately swear out a warrant for Mercer's arrest. Laban Mercer was arrested and brought before the Wetzel County Court, where he was formally charged with the murder of John Gamble. His case was to be tried at the next gathering of the circuit court the following spring. Word of Mercer's arrest and John Hindman's curious vision was flashed around the country via newspapers and broadsides. Some accounts were serious in nature, others not quite so much. True to the sensationalism of the times, the papers boldly proclaimed that it was the ghost of John Gamble who had made the charge of murder, or John Gamble who would be the key witness at the upcoming trial. In truth, neither assertion was accurate, and authorities later went to great pains to make it clear that John Hindman's account was not the only evidence upon which the charges had been made. In April of 1854, Laban Mercer's trial began. Hindman swore out an affidavit insisting that his account of some kind of odd encounter was true, although he is reported to have never actually used the word ghost or spirit. In what was an obvious stroke of luck for Mercer, the court refused to allow the so-called spectral testimony to be admitted as evidence. Laban Mercer was acquitted of all charges, though his reputation in the region was forever soured. According to later accounts, he left the area, later fought in the Civil War, and died sometime in 1888 or 1889. One retelling of the tale from April of 1889 states that Mercer, on his deathbed, confessed to the crime of which he had been accused. This account, however, must be taken with a grain of salt, as it inexplicably gives Mercer's name as Messer. The tale was apparently potent enough to spawn at least one copycat rendition. In May of 1892, the St. Louis Globe Democrat published this account of what is obviously the same incident. The story, however, completely reverses the roles of John Gamble and Laban Mercer and places the spectral tale in Tennessee. So, unlike Hester Shue's dramatic spiritual revelations, the words of John Gamble via John Hindman were not enough to sway a public jury. Could John Hindman have been telling the truth? Is it really possible that he chanced upon the restless spirit of John Gamble, who implored him to seek justice for his death? Robert Cox, the man who owned the property upon which the alleged encounter took place, actually saw John Gamble on the day he vanished. Cox later spoke with Hindman about the apparition he encountered. Although Hindman had come to New Martinsville well after John Gamble's death, he was, at least to Robert Cox's satisfaction, 
able to accurately describe the size, clothing, and mannerisms of John Gamble. Could this have been a coincidence, or perhaps even a lucky guess? Could Heinemann have possibly seen a photograph or painting of John Gamble, learned of the unsolved disappearance, and perhaps decided to give the justice system a gentle prodding? History and legend may forever cloud these questions, for as far as we know, the ghost of John Gamble never showed his spectral form again. However, we have to pause for at least a moment and ask ourselves just one tantalizing question. Given the renewed interest in cold cases and true crime in general, is it possible that John Gamble might be tempted to show himself once more? As with our regular summations, it might be best if we all pay close attention. Our next tale is another interesting mixture of history, legend, and the paranormal. The setting? Another West Virginia town which owes its existence and growth to a river, in this case, the Great Kanawha. Today, Charleston is best known as the capital of the mountain state and its most populous city. None of that could be said in 1862, when the horrors of America's Civil War swept through the valley and left in its wake not only death and destruction, but at least one enduring mystery. The Charleston of today bears little resemblance to its 1860s counterpart. With a population of just over 2,000, it was little more than a valley town which had sprung up at the convergence of the Elk and Kanawha Rivers. King Cole had yet to begin his reign. At the time, the presiding monarch could well be called King or Queen Salt. In the days before refrigeration, the salt works to the east of Charleston were an important part in the preservation of meats and other foods. Pork and beef on its way to Cincinnati, then known as Porkopolis, found the region's natural resource vital to its own existence. The need and demand for Kanawha salt only increased with the onset of the Civil War. Union forces occupied Charleston and the Kanawha Valley in 1861. Sentiment throughout the region was just as contentious as anywhere else. The cliché of brother fighting brother was painfully close to the truth. The Great Kanawha River and its many tributaries became a vital link from east to west, keeping Washington and other Union cities connected with the Ohio Valley in the Midwest. Although well south of the main east-west conduit in Wheeling, the Kanawha River had one major advantage over the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Simply put, you can't blow up a river. In stark contrast with the East, the first eight months of 1862 were comparatively quiet west of the Appalachians. The calm, however, was not destined to last. In early September, rebel forces moved up the Shenandoah Valley and turned their eyes westward. Objective? Seize the valuable salt works and open another avenue to the Ohio River. Under the command of General William Loring, the rebels marched into the valley and began a rapid push towards Charleston. Unable to make an effective stand in the mountainous region, Union forces, under the command of General Joseph Lightburn, began a swift but mostly orderly retreat. On the morning of September 13, 1862, Lightburn entered Charleston and attempted to make a stand. Panicked by the certainty of a deadly battle, many of Charleston's citizens either fled or took refuge on Cox Hill. Lightburn's troops soon found themselves under cannon fire from both sides of the Kanawha. All during the day, burning shot poured down on the Union forces from the heights south of town. Lightburn's troops bottlenecked at the one bridge which crossed the Elk River. 
Soldiers, wagons, cattle, and cannons spent the better part of the day in a desperate attempt to move west. Meanwhile, the hot fire from the rebel batteries ignited fires throughout the town. Eventually, Lightburn himself gave orders to put the torch to all federal stores as well as other buildings which might be of use to the rebels. Eventually, the bridge over the Elk River gave way. Still under heavy fire, a pontoon bridge was hastily erected, and the remainder of Lightburn's men began a rapid dash up the Ripley Road towards Ravenswood. For whatever reason, General Loring did not give chase. He instead chose to stay and occupy what was left of Charleston. His stay, however, would be a short one. Just over six weeks later, a reorganized Union force led by General Scammon swept down the Kanawha River from Point Pleasant and drove the rebels out of the valley. Charleston and the Kanawha Valley would remain in Union hands for the rest of the war. Charleston and the Kanawha Valley were occupied by the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry. While the citizenry began putting the town back together, Union forces established a headquarters camp on the southern side of the Kanawha River, just below the heights so effectively utilized by the rebel cannoneers. The mass of tents and timber was christened Camp White. This 1863 oil painting depicts the only known image of the Union's modest headquarters. In early 1863, command of the 23rd Ohio was transferred to 40-year-old Ohio native Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes. Yes, that Rutherford B. Hayes. Of equal irony, another member of the 23rd Ohio bore a nom de plume that may sound vaguely familiar, Sergeant William McKinley. Under Colonel Hayes's direction, a fortification was erected on the heights overlooking Charleston and the Elk River. Still visible amid the landscape to this day, the fortified position was dubbed Fort Scammon. The threat of small raids by groups of rebel soldiers, nicknamed Bushwhackers, was a constant, though mostly minor, threat. Aside from these sporadic guerrilla raids, Charleston and the Kanawha Valley remained mostly quiet for the rest of the war. Colonel Hayes later described a beautiful, mostly tranquil setting with a friendly populace. Hayes remained in command of the 23rd Ohio until June of 1864. At war's end, the Union troops withdrew. Colonel Hayes and Sergeant McKinley would each go on to be elected President of the United States. By 1905, 40 years after the war's end, Charleston, the once tiny hamlet along the Kanawha River, had grown by leaps and bounds. In 1885, it became the permanent capital of the young state of West Virginia. Accentuating this designation, An impressive, brightly red-brick structure was erected in 1885. For the next 36 years, it would serve as the seat of government for the Mountain State. From 1893 until 1897, its executive suite was occupied by Governor William A. McCorkle, a lawyer from Western Virginia who set up offices in Charleston in 1879 and later served as Kanawha County prosecuting attorney. Following his one term in office, McCorkle remained in Charleston and continued practicing law. In 1904, he began construction of an ornate mansion atop the hill south of the city, just below the site where Camp White had been located. The mansion would later be christened Sunrise. The hill was quite steep and would necessitate a winding carriage trail on a steady grade to gently traverse the slope from the railroad tracks to the mansion. According to McCorkle, as well as other contemporary reports, construction on the 0.65-mile-long carriage trail began in 1905. About 100 yards from the tracks of the Chesapeake and Ohio, A ghost from Charleston's past was apparently disturbed, or rather, more accurately, a pair of ghosts. 
Governor McCorkle, in his 1928 autobiography, recounted the incident. The road to Sunrise was made up to the head of a hollow, a very isolated place. When excavating for the road, I dug up the remains of two women, one blonde and the other brunette. This excited a good deal of controversy as to whom these women might be, and I was unable to find out who had been buried in such an out-of-the-way spot as it then was. An article published on October 23, 1927, elaborated slightly on just what was found, stating that the remains consisted of, quote, a few teeth, a pair of skulls, portions of hip bones, and feet. McCorkle made inquiries to John Slack, a former Union soldier and authority on the history of the Kanawha Valley. Slack advised that the bodies were those of two women who had been executed as spies by the rebel army while it was stationed in Charleston. The women, both camp followers, had been convicted in a drumhead court-martial and taken up the hollow where each were shot and buried. McCorkle, however, sought a second opinion on the matter. He next spoke to another victim of the war, James Pauline, a former soldier in the Confederate Army. Pauline advised that John Slack was essentially correct, but had the armies backwards. According to Pauline, the women had been tried as rebel spies in 1862 and executed by the Union Army while it was camped near the Hollow's entrance. Years later, a deathbed confession by a man who claimed to have been a member of the Union firing squad seemed to corroborate Pauline's version of events. Governor McCorkle had the remains fully exhumed and moved several feet to a spot off the carriage trail. He subsequently had a fair-sized stone marker erected alongside the spot where the women had been found. On the stone were carved the following words. In the second year of the Civil War, two women, convicted as spies by a drumhead court-martial, were brought to this spot, shot, and here buried. In 1905, when building this road to sunrise, their remains were disinterred and reburied opposite this stone. William A. McCorkle. It is interesting to note that McCorkle made no mention of either the Union or Confederate Army. The carriage trail and Sunrise Mansion were eventually completed and, to this day, dominate the southern heights of Charleston. Far below the grand white columns, the monument and burial site of the two nameless souls remained largely out of view to most Charlestonians. Years later, the trail would again be adorned with a monument to tragedy. Governor McCorkle's only daughter, Isabel, was killed in an automobile accident on June 12, 1926. Shattered by the loss, McCorkle had this shrine and statue of Christ erected in her memory. Governor William A. McCorkle died on September 24, 1930, at the age of 73. Following his death, his ashes were interned at the base of the monument to his daughter. With three sets of mortal remains and a Gothic monument to the deceased lining the drive, the question was perhaps not whether, but when the ghosts would appear. According to the Daily Mail article from 1927, the spirits of the alleged female spies had made their presence known well before Governor McCorkle's passing. Although somewhat whimsical in its portrayal, the article states that servants employed at sunrise had observed the pair of spirits traversing the carriage trail during certain seasons of the year. Since 1961, the old carriage road has been a popular walking trail open to the public. Several other people have also reported seeing wispy apparitions of the two figures along the lower section of the trail. The alleged spies are not the only reported source of paranormal activity along the Sunrise Carriage Trail. Over the years, patrons of Sunrise, during the time it served as a public museum, reported seeing the apparition of Governor McCorkle himself 
walking the grounds around his beloved home. Given that his love for Sunrise extended to the point that he desired to be interred there, it would not be a stretch to the imagination to think that he might not be in such a hurry to depart. Perhaps he feels his duty to West Virginia is not yet over. Maybe he wants another term as governor. Or perhaps he harbors a feeling of guilt at having disturbed the rest of the two nameless individuals. Could their bonds to Sunrise and its trail be connected? Or could Governor McCorkle simply have loved Sunrise so much that he refused to leave even in death? And what of the governor's own losses, his wife and daughter? His wife, Belle, also passed away at sunrise in 1923. His only daughter, Isabel, died young and under tragic circumstances. The governor's own actions may well have bound a part of her to the carriage trail as well. The statue erected by Governor McCorkle in memory of his daughter has reportedly also chilled a few spines over the decades. Legend has it that blood has been observed dripping from the statue's eyes at the stroke of midnight, an event said to occur, more often than not, on All Hallows' Eve. Five individuals, all with ties of one kind or another to sunrise. Governor McCorkle, his wife, Belle, his daughter, Isabel, and the Jane Doe's buried near the carriage trail's terminus. Could they all have left their presence behind in some ethereal way? The deaths of Governor McCorkle, his wife, Belle, and daughter, Isabel, are established facts, as are their ties to Sunrise and its grounds. But what of the two unknowns unearthed in 1905? If either tale told to Governor McCorkle is accurate, then one has to wonder why the pair would continue to haunt the ground where they breathe their last. Are they seeking justice for their execution? Could they perhaps have been angered that their remains had been disturbed? Or are they seeking to merely have their true identities confirmed and their characters vindicated? Or are they perhaps simply trying to set the historic record straight? Were they really spies? Were they executed? Were they even women? In this regard, the historical record is nearly mute. Historians concede that either tale imparted to Governor McCorkle is at least plausible, though they feel equally as certain that whatever the true facts are, they have become twisted and confused by time. If they were spies executed by one of the occupying armies, then the location and time of their burial, in general, favors the Union Army as the executioners. Charleston was occupied by Union forces far longer than it was by rebel forces, and history has confirmed that the Union headquarters, Camp White, was located just west of the Hollow's opening. Could there be any real surviving proof? If the pair were unjustly executed, denied a fair trial, and stripped of their identity as well as their lives, could there be any chance of vindication through documentation? Very little contemporary written material from Charleston during the Civil War has survived the years, and even less in terms of a visual record. By 1862, when the Union Army returned for good, all newspapers had ceased operation. The presses would not start rolling again until 1864. The official records of both the Union and Confederate armies have survived and paint a detailed picture of the Battle of Charleston from both sides. However, once calm had returned to the region, the reports and correspondence grew shorter. In fact, Colonel Hayes is personally responsible for what is probably the best preserved record of the happenings in Charleston during Union occupation. His personal diaries and letters paint a vivid, much more relatable vista, commenting on the daily life both in camp and in town. Both Hayes's diary and the official record make repeated references to rebel guerrilla raids and the capturing of prisoners 
but nowhere in any of the surviving documentation is there mention of the capture of, much less the execution of, any spies. Today, hundreds if not thousands of people walk or jog past the memorials along the carriage trail. The Charleston it leads to has changed drastically since the days when brother was fighting brother. What was once Camp White is today the site of the Southside Expressway and the CSX rail line. Much has changed in the last 160 years. Indeed, it is unlikely that Colonel Hayes or Sergeant McKinley would recognize much on the other side of the Kanawha River. And it is, in a way, a shame that they cannot be here. For perhaps they could possibly shed some light on the identities and fate of the two individuals interred near their former camp. Two individuals whose names have been lost to that most indelible of all forces, time. It has been said that it is unfair to ask the dead who killed who unless they themselves are the victim. If this ethereal rule is hard and fast, then it would probably do no good to summon the spirits of Colonel Hayes, Sergeant McKinley, or Laban Mercer. Perhaps they have taken their respective secrets with them to the grave, leaving it to the spirits of the victims to reach out for help from us in the land of the living. So, the next time you think you see a wispy spectral form or hear a faint ghostly voice on the breeze, stay calm and pay close attention, for you just might be gifted with the answers to something mysterious. Thank you.